Hello, I'm Lucy Armstrong and I'm chair of the Port of Tyne. Prior to the start of the COVID uh, pandemic in 2020, the Port of Tyne board, uh, I was probably a fairly standard chairman that we met uh, face to face uh, in the port buildings. And uh, we did something which was uh, because our board comes from all over the place. We have someone from France, a number of people uh, down in London, as well as some of us based uh, locally here in the northeast. And we would cram all of our board meetings and subcommittee meetings into a sort of two day uh, period and it was all fairly intense. We liked seeing one another and um, it was all pretty efficient. Covid came and suddenly we couldn't go to the port. So the first challenge for me as an individual was to think how do I demonstrate to my colleagues that I, I'm supporting them, that I'm appreciative of their work, and that I understand that they are doing something over and beyond what we would normally expect. And how could I acknowledge to them that I understood we were in a crisis and I appreciated how they were rising to that challenge. So whilst the one to one interaction I had with my chief exec on the phone, uh, on Teams, um, same with the FD, probably upped a bit, actually the number of formal meetings I halved. We became more transactional in the meetings because we, we recognised that you couldn't spend as much time on the screen. It's very hard as a chair to read body language on a screen. It's very hard actually to chair. In a real life, you can stare people out if you want them to shut up. You can swivel away from them. Those kind of techniques, all of that body language technique almost exhausts when, you're, when you are on screen. So uh, I not only halved the number to provide space and time for the executive to get on and to plan and to do. Uh, I probably spent a little bit more time than normal in the early days of the crisis, checking in with each non-exec, how they felt about the changes. And as a habit anyway, I generally at the end of the meeting ask people individually that we share collectively, just very quickly, one good thing about the meeting and one thing we do differently. We carried on doing that for the first few months on Zoom so that we could get better at uh, communicating with one another on Zoom. We're going to experiment with that until the end of 2021. We're going to keep checking in whether that's working for us, whether we need to do something different. Uh, but that's our plan. Interestingly, when we start again, we've decided that we must have a restart as a board. And therefore, our first meeting is not going to be a meeting. We're going to go for a walk. We're going to go for a walk along the banks of the River Tyne, which is what we're responsible for. But the reason we're going for a walk is, A, it's easier to have a uh, socially distanced discussion outside and the bio uh, risks are much lower of the virus. But we're going for a walk to reconnect with one another as human beings. We are then going to have our formal board meetings back in real life in a meeting room, but we are going to keep our subcommittees as completely virtual. One of the things we got wrong, I think, back in the old world was by cramming all of our meetings together in two days, there wasn't actually enough reflection time between subcommittees and those issues coming to the main board. By having our subcommittees virtually, they'll take place maybe two, three weeks before the main board, there isn't the need to travel. And then there'll be time for everybody, both on the subcommittee and those who aren't, to reflect on the content of their work and their opinions, their views, for when we come to the board as a whole. A constant challenge for a port is how do we make those walls, how, how can you go through the walls, how can you make them transparent? And actually the COVID crisis of 2020 and into 2021, in some respects has exacerbated that because traditionally what we would have done would be invite people to come and look round the port. We'd, uh, because it's exciting to see a river, it's exciting to see a pilot boat, it's exciting to see uh, trains with wood pellet on them or cranes working or huge warehouses full of tea or full of barber coats or full of product. So one of our challenges is how could we make the port stay alive during a time when nobody could come through the walls, including half or over half of our own colleagues. 
the other thing that the poor often does, and because we are um, a trust poor and we hold the river in trust on behalf of future generations of the people of the Northeast, we would hold annual events, public meetings, where we would talk about both the financial performance of the commercial side of the organization and that wider custodian role. Uh, but in fact, we are going to do that this summer. So instead of having a face to face meeting, uh, at which typically we'll get the local press, we might get some councillors, but that's about it. We're actually going to do that exclusively online. And if it's anything like some of our neighbouring ports, particularly Blythe, a little bit further up the coast, they got something like five or six times as many people. They got, I think it was 150 odd people attending their event. So we're hopeful that actually the technology will enable multiple ways of listening to and communicating with our different constituencies locally here in the Northeast and wider uh, uh, a field. The COVID pandemic has made us realize that the technology does enable us to have footprints elsewhere in the world. We have joined something called the Connected Ports Initiative. And here we are sitting in the Northeast of England, talking regularly, colleagues talking regularly to those other ports and learning from them all around the world. Something that technology has enabled that we would never have dreamt of doing in the past. And I think the crisis has just accelerated our learning in that regard.